Uh, our first presenter on this panel is Brett King. His thesis is entitled, As the World Turns, Gay, Not Queer, Privileging Heteronormalized Representations of Sexuality in American Soap Operas from 1977 to the Present. In this project, Brett King argues that American daytime soap operas since the 1970s have adopted prevailing discur discursive ideas of queerness, we articulated them, and introduced new, discur new discursive understandings of queerness into popular culture. Most often, these re-articulated representations reflect a heteronormalized model owing to myriad historically situated discourses related to human sexuality, for example, mental health, AIDS, and gender identity. This point is made through a broad examination of these shifting discourses, coupled with a direct analysis of salient queer characters and storylines that appear concurrently within daytime serials. Building on feminist and media theory, King includes queer theory to frame a comprehensive, historical discursive understanding of queerness in soap operas. I present Brett King. <coughs> Else who's here today. How the hell can anybody respect the opinion of a man who would put his hands on another man? That was the question Blake Carrington, patriarch of ABC's primetime soap opera Dynasty, aimed at his gay son in the first episode. Moments later, the senior Carrington added, I forgot. The American Psychiatric Association has decided that it's no longer a disease. <laughs> I could have endowed a foundation. The Stephen Carrington Institute for the Treatment and Study of Faggotry. This exchange, which underscores an understanding of queerness dictated by medical experts, laid the groundwork for what would become one of soap opera most iconic gay storylines and characters. Since that time, however, many academics who study the culturally and socially inscribed representations of sexual identity in soaps have failed to look beyond the significantly problematic Stephen Carrington character and storyline for examples of queerness. This is especially true of analyses that focus on soaps that air on network television in the United States, which often highlight primetime programming but ignore daytime. Further, these academic studies typically focus on the ostensibly positive or negative qualities these representations embody, rather than looking at the role of discourses, the culturally sanctioned ways of understanding and discussing a subject, and producing mediated representations of queerness this project takes a different and more comprehensive approach. Using historical and discursive analysis, the essay analyzes representations of queerness in American daytime serials since 1977 and interrogates the relevant, historically shifting discourses that informed those representations. In the process, this paper makes three arguments. First, soap operas adopt prevailing historically situated discourses. For example, representations of queerness in soaps of the 1970s articulated lesbians and gays as mentally unstable, abject others, a reflection of prevailing beliefs at the time. Second, the soap genre re-articulates these discourses to varying ends. For instance, in light of growing queer political power held by groups like ACT UP in the 1980s, daytime began challenging more problematic discursive ideas of non-heterosexuality that erupted concurrently with the advent of AIDS. Third, daytime serials introduce these re-articulated representations of queerness into popular culture, privileging certain types of non-heterosexuality at the expense of others. By way of example, in the 2000s, monogamy between white same-sex couples was established as normative, even as queer black men were framed as out-of-control sexual threats to society at large. This cycle of adoption, re-articulation, and introduction is demonstrated over the course of four parts in my paper, which look individually at the decades of the 1970s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. A significant component of this work is the argument that representations of queerness in soaps have been heteronormalized over the last 40 years. Characters have been transformed into what Jim Bacon calls queer clones, which have been sanitized with broader consumption. They function to restore gender norms, even as they disrupt other heteronormative notions. This has been a result of shifting discourses linked to, the queer linked to queerness in the public realm, such as psychology and AIDS, converging with attempts by producers of daytime serials to represent queerness in a way that will maximize viewership and play gay sponsors. As a result, those sexualized identities currently most underrepresented in soaps are the ones who do not readily conform to Western understandings of appropriate gender and queerness. Instead, viewers receive representations closer to the heteronormative center, or in essence, heteronormalized homosexuals. And the farther from center the characters are, the more derisively they are represented. 
Daytime serials are used for analysis purposes because the longevity and serialization of the genre generates powerful connections between audience members and characters over time. As such, understanding the discursive knowledge about queerness that is encoded in soap storylines is imperative as the characters therein function simultaneously as the product of discursively produced knowledge about sexuality and producers of knowledge about sexuality for audiences at home. In the interest of time, I offer the findings of my final case study, one of nine total, which uses the series Passions as its primary text, and which looks at melodramatic representations of black queerness and intersexuality, moreover, in the millennial decade. With the introduction of Passions' black male, black male character in 2006, eventually revealed as Vincent Clark, <coughs> the series' portrayal of queerness became problematic. Originally written as a mentally unstable gay black man, the Clarkson character was coerced by his grandfather into attacking the citizens of Harmony's pa of Harmony, Passions' fictional community. He committed a litany of heinous deeds, including rape and the murder of at least two people, one of whom was his half-sister's lesbian lover. Clarkson was portrayed as a willing instigator of incest as well. He raped his paternal half-sister twice, knowingly carried on a long-term affair with his half-uncle, and even had sex with his own father. Clarkson's penchant for incest is the first discursive articulation that must be underscored. Foucault refers to incest as, quote, the rule of rules, end quote, one of the earliest cultural taboos that must not be violated. Foucault notes that eroticism between family members has been discursively prohibited through the overlapping of two technologies of power operating within Western <coughs> cultures. The first is the deployment of alliance, quote, a system of marriage, of fixation and development of kinship ties, and of transmission of names and possessions which is devoted to the maintaining of societal order through inscribing and enforcing legally permissible and non-permissible <coughs> behavior between individuals and partners. The second technology of power is the deployment of sexuality, an apparatus, quote, superimposed on the previous one, and which, without completely supplanting the other, helped to reduce its importance, end quote. Within heteronormative Western society, the family union, the interchange for the deployment of alliance and sexuality, functions as an agent of socialization and a model of acceptable sexuality, an operation that is dependent upon the preservation of ordered binaries, particularly the husband, wife, and parent child. To violate that order through an act of incest, then, exposes sexuality's always already status as a subject of power, and poses a potential disruption to, quote, the sway of law and right, end quote. Thus, by engaging in the ultimate societal taboo, Passion's Clarkson characters are automatically positioned in opposition to the heteronormative cultural order. On a similar level, the character's scripted behaviors actively represent the false parallel between homosexuality and incest frequently invoked by the likes of former U.S. Senator Rick Santorum and other right-wing ideologues who use such rhetoric as a means of dehumanizing and stigmatizing the queer community. Clarkson's portrayal as a rapist and murderer also reinforces the myth of gay men as predators, a discourse used to imply that gay men specifically cannot control themselves sexually. However, in light of the fact that Clarkson is embodied by an African-American male, a double stigmatization occurs. The discursive articulation of black men as savages is also represented. Following the end of Clarkson's affair with his uncle, a relationship that will be discussed in greater detail shortly, it was revealed that the villain was not a biological man after all. In September 2007, viewers watched as Valerie Davis, a female character who had been part of the Passions canvas for a full two years before Clarkson was even mentioned, suddenly began speaking with both her own voice and that of Clarkson. Okay, you can come out now. Good job fooling our mother like that. Thank you. No, dear, thank you. <laughs> I should have a hard time believing I'm gone for good. Because I'm not. No mama. The little boy is alive and well. A man is hell. Notwithstanding, Clarkson, Clarkson was nonetheless still informed by the earlier problematic encodings concerning sexuality and race. In this way, the sudden revelation that the psychotic Clarkson was intersexed and had been living in an ongoing secondary life as Valerie Davis 
itself a poss possible indication of some kind of multiple personality disorder, served to seriously pathologize intersexuality and represent it in an absurdist, mocking way. The characters retconned identity and objectified gendered state, which was intended to lie somewhere between the poles of absolute maleness and absolute femaleness, was subsequently maintained through the remainder of the series, when producers employed both actors in their alternating depictions of Clarkson and his fourth. Similarly, the inclusion of a pregnancy storyline, which concluded with Clarkson's mother helping him deliver the baby that his own father had sired, <laughs> further, <laughs> further established the character's ostensibly disordered and contrary nature. Clarkson's gender was repeatedly located outside the culturally accepted, essentialized binary of male and female, and repeated references to Clarkson's incestuous liaisons inscribed him as a threat to the family unit and, by extension, the dominant heteronormative order. And it was not only Passion's intersex storyline that reinforced problematic discurs discursive notions of queerness and race. The portrayal of Clarkson's lover and uncle, Chad Harris Crane, was also troubling. But married to a woman, Paris Crane frequented gay bars and unknowingly carried on a sexual affair with his nephew for months. All the while, he maintained that he wasn't gay. Add to this Harris Crane's dark complexion, and the resultant mixture is a clear nod to the stereotype of a black man living on the down low. Moreover, in the depiction of one of Harris Crane and Clarkson's sexual liaisons, the ca camera zeroes in on Harris Crane selecting a condom out of a large blue box. Ostensibly, producers intended for this action to be read by audiences as a tacit reminder of safer sex practices. However, because such practices are not the focus between heterosexual and queer white characters in the genre, this liaison between two black characters stands out. The very presence of a condom in the scene connotes what Nicole Battelliot has identified as an invisible sign of contagion, which marks, quote, thus when Cash's producers made the choice to focus on the box of condoms instead of Chad and Benson, they reified the black non-heterosexual subject's status as an at-risk, out-of-control figure. This understanding is further highlighted by the fact that, unlike depictions of same-sex eroticism between white gays and lesbians that came before and after, the sexual encounters between Harris Crane and Clarkson are neither employed nor post-coitus, but rather aggressive and in public spaces. The end result of Passion's treatment of the intersection of sexuality and race is that queer characters of color were pathologized, both mentally and physically. Similarly, through the story and scene elements that inevitably became the focus of their relationship, in essence the objectification of intersexuality, the focus on condoms, etc., these figures and the identities they represent were discursively marked as being different from and less than white queer subjects. These factors work together to create additional layers within the hierarchy of sexual representation proposed by Gail S. Rubin, situated below representations in ascending order of trans persons, white gays and lesbians, and heterosexuals. In its entirety, my four-part historical and discursive analysis demonstrates how the soap genre has adopted historically situated and shifting discourses surrounding issues of sexual identity, re-articulated them, and then introduced new forms of dis discursive knowledge about queerness into popular culture. Specifically, they have produced an understanding of queerness that has been heteronormalized and which further enshrines a discursive hierarchy of appropriate <coughs> and inappropriate forms of sexuality. So with this information in hand, where do we go? At the moment, media the depictions of intersexuality are highly problematic, and this needs to be addressed. Similarly, responsible representations of transgenderism should be advocated, as should depictions of bisexuality as a self-identified preference. The relationship-dependent conventions of the soap genre and other mainstream forms of popular culture would also seem to exclude any possibility of asexuality being represented. And of course, the positive inclusion of queer people of color is practically non-existent and needs to be challenged. In working toward more inclusive representations for the future, we should seek representations that are primarily, though not entirely, depicted in an affirmative manner. Second, representations of queerness in soap operas and elsewhere must be heavily scrutinized, and encoded heterosexism and homophobic messages and or insinuations must be scrubbed, or at least acknowledged and problematized. Finally, an effort must be made to abolish the various hierarchies of representation that are present in the genre and in our culture. Uh, just as gay and lesbian characters cannot be portrayed solely as living an inferior lifestyle to their straight counterparts, characters whose desires or physical features fall elsewhere on the spectrums of love and gender must not be marginalized and maligned in favor of heterosexuals and heteronormalized homosexuals. 